is what blows my mind. <laughs> Honestly, it is an amazing satellite. It's really gonna revolutionize how we see water on the planet. And I think that that's really amazing to be on such an awesome project. <laughs> SWAT is the Surface Water and Ocean Topography Mission. It's a new satellite launched by NASA, our partners at the French Space Agency, and additionally partners in Canada and the UK. From space, it can actually see like what the height of, a of, of water in a river is to about 10 centimeters. And then at the same time, it's seeing images of that so it can tell you where the water is. And this is just a game changer for our ability to understand how much water is flowing through rivers, how much water is stored in lakes and reservoirs, and how ocean circulation works. In order to understand SWAT's capabilities, we really need to collect on the ground data to compare to SWAT. And we're doing that in a number of different locations around the world. The Waimakariri River, it's, it's a braided river in New Zealand. And when I say braided river, right, it means that you have all of these different channels weaving in and out with sand and gravel bars in between. If we're going to um, understand SWAT's capabilities to measure rivers, we don't just want to think about really nice, well-behaved rivers. We also want to think about those sort of poorly behaved problem child rivers. The Waimakariri definitely falls into that category. It's a challenging, interesting, difficult river, and we want to understand how well SWAT can, can measure that kind of river too. The Waimak is a river that has a lot of moods. Some days it's just this beautiful like glacial blue water and it just like sparkles. But then sometimes you go out and it's a completely different creature and the water can turn from beautiful blue to like this mean muddy brown. It's just a wild unpredictable beast. We're collecting data to compare to the SWAT satellite in a bunch of different ways down here in New Zealand. So the first and maybe the simplest thing that we're doing is we're installing water level loggers. So those can tell us how water level goes up and down and we can compare that to SWAT data. We're also using measurements from a boat. We, we put a fancy GPS on the boat that's gonna be able to tell us uh, the elevation of the water surface as we drive up and down the river. And then the last thing that we're doing, which is really cool, is we have a laser system that gets mounted on a helicopter. It's called a LIDAR. Essentially what it does is it pings lasers from the helicopter off of the land and water surface and measures how long it takes for the light to come back to the sensor. And we can use that to create really detailed topography of not just like the sand and gravel bars and things around the river, but actually of the surface of the water in the river. And that's exactly what we're measuring from SWAT so we can compare this data that we're collecting from helicopters against uh, the SWAT data as well. Water is everything. <laughs> and so the data that we're collecting here is gonna help on so many levels, like not only for tracking how much water is in rivers and being able to track how much we can pull out of them in a sustainable manner, but to also SWAT will track the level in lakes and reservoirs. So that's for resource management is gonna be really, really big. It's a lot of trying to track where the water is, and that's such a fundamental resource, especially right now with climate change that's changing very quickly. And so being able to track it on a global scale, especially in places where we don't have gauges, is really important to be able to tell those communities what their water is and how much they have.
We're taking you underneath the Shake Table Earthquake Simulator. We are going in what is called the reaction mass. It's a gigantic bathtub of reinforced concrete. Just above our heads is the largest outdoor earthquake simulator in the world. Three, two, one. With a capacity to hold 2,000 metric tons, researchers tested the tallest full-scale building ever to be constructed on a shake table. The simulator can replicate the ground motions recorded during real earthquakes, like the 6.7 magnitude Northridge earthquake in California and the 7.7 Chi Chi earthquake in Taiwan. In real time, the team at UC San Diego monitors the movements measured by strategically placed sensors. So here, this is another accelerometer? Exactly. There are three that are somewhere else to measure in this direction, and there are five to measure the vertical. Okay. And these are part of the very smart control system. Every half a millisecond, the, the measure of the acceleration goes to the controller, which compares to what the table should have been at. Pretty good on the valve one. What's new and what's exciting is that now this shake table can move three-dimensionally. I think back in, before it used to just move back and forth. Now there are six degrees of movement. Before we could move only in this direction. Now because of these two and the two on the other side, we can move north-south like that as well. We can yo as well like that. And now with the six actuators that are underneath, we can move up and down. We can pitch and you can roll. Roll, pitch, yo, Roll, and then... Pitch, yo. The new dimensions of movement mean more realistic earthquake simulations. Have you ever been down here while it's moving oh, and shaking? It's not allowed. Okay. It's too dangerous, you know, when, when everything is at high pressure, we do not allow anybody okay. down here. High pressure is how this shake table moves. Every piston of every actuator is powered by pressurized oil. That oil travels through a complex circuit of colorful heavy steel pipes, starting from the building next door. So is this sort of the powerhouse? The yeah, power this is the, the... what we call the hydraulic power system. When the system is powered up, the nitrogen and hydraulic oil in each of those huge black cylinders, known as the accumulator bank, is pressurized to 5,000 PSI. Then the oil is released through thick red pipes down below at a velocity of up to 40 feet per second. The oil is circulating at such a speed that, you know, it gets warm. That high force flow powers the actuators that move the actual table. Every test generates more data for research teams to analyze. Ultimately, that translates to better building codes and more accurate computer modeling systems. Our goal with a facility like this is to save many lives in the future, in California, in the U.S., and in the world from earthquake disasters and also to prevent tremendous economic losses after an earthquake and, and that it takes many, many years to rebuild. These fish are ancient. They have seen glaciers come and go. They've been here for millions of years. And we're using some of the most innovative and cutting edge technology to better understand them out of a place of respect and appreciation so that we can do what we can to conserve and, and restore these populations. The brook trout is the only native trout species to the Appalachian region. In addition to its cultural and economic significance, the brook trout has also become an important species for environmental conservation. It's the canary in the coal mine for climate change in Appalachian streams. Studying the migration of fish has always been a challenge. In order to keep track of individual fish, researchers have traditionally used what are known as pit tags. These tags must be surgically implanted into each fish for tracking. This can be a time-consuming and expensive project, not to mention uncomfortable for the fish. However, researchers at the UVA School of Data Science have teamed up with experts at the U.S. Geological Survey to develop a new approach to tracking individual fish. Utilizing computer vision and machine learning techniques, the researchers have developed methods for identifying a fish from a single image. Once implemented, this new technique will reduce the need for pit tags and facilitate the expansion of ecological research around the globe. At the beginning, we analyzed the fish images and uh, tried to identify 
interesting viral patterns which can distinguish fish individuals. There are a couple of benchmarks that we use morphologically on the body of these fish. One is the lateral line. This is a, a sensory organ on the side of fish, and you can see it as a small line in the middle of the side of the fish. And on the lateral line, you'll typically see large oval-shaped dark circles. Those are called par marks. Those are generally visible in younger life, life stages. And then you'll see pigmentation spots on top of those par marks. So that gives us several layers of information that we can use to fingerprint these fish, essentially. So being able to, to identify individuals and use population models that are based on individual identification, or in, individual ID, lets us do a whole new class of models that are much more sensitive. The challenge is, so this stream that we're at is called the Westbrook, and we study this stream since 1997 with physical tags. Imagine we could have anglers out there or other people that can catch fish taking pictures of fish and getting information on individuals in a whole bunch of places. Right now, we only work on the images, but in the future, we want to deploy video-based uh, solutions. So imagine we had a whole bunch of video cameras set out in the stream here, combine that with ind individual identification, basically get a real-time continuous census of the population. That would change everything in how we, how we monitor populations. You know, a lot of people are, um skeptical of AI or afraid of what it could do. I think the more we have projects like this that show the value for conservation, the better off we're going to be and the better off that AI can be in society. Today's computer chip contains features that are so tightly packed together that there are only a few nanometers between each object. To make this possible, manufacturers etch fine resolution structure onto chips in a process that involves shooting lasers at microscopic droplets of tin. However, the exploding tin droplets send charged particles flying in all directions, including toward the expensive, highly sensitive mirror used to collect the light for etching. My name is Ahmed Diallo. I'm a principal research physicist in the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Current solution to this problem, such as placing a protective gas in front of the mirror to slow down the particle, are inefficient and can block the light from reaching the mirror. We developed a way to protect this mirror from the tin particles by creating a magnetic free zone, an area where all magnetic fields cancel each other out. This will guide particles away from the reflective surfaces. My name is Ben Israeli. I'm a graduate student in the Plasma Physics program at Princeton University. Our new strategy can increase the lifetime of the mirror so that it doesn't need to be replaced as often. The solution provides greater productivity and decreases the cost of making computer chips that can be used for application to help solve some of the world's toughest science and technology challenges. Hey, welcome, come on in. This is the Department of Energy's Argonne National Laboratory. We are the home of the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. And what we do is we basically build supercomputers. ALCF is home to our newest, biggest supercomputer, Aurora. Aurora is one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. It will have a peak performance of about two exaflops. And so this computer is gonna be really important. It's gonna solve important problems in climate change, human health, material science, and here we are. This is Aurora. This is where the magic happens. So Aurora puts the super in supercomputer. Problems that used to take years to solve now just take days. Aurora is so big that we actually had to build this state-of-the-art building just to house it. Isn't it a great new building? Yeah, it does smell like brand new, mm. like a car. Yeah, 
but a supercar. Okay, so let's talk about Aurora's stats. There are 300 miles of optical cabling, so that will reach from Chicago to St. Louis. It covers 10,000 square feet, two NBA basketball courts. And Aurora is about 600 tons. That is as heavy as the biggest passenger airplane in the world. It has 160 racks that are eight feet tall and arranged in eight rows. And now let's look at one of the blades. All right. Each Aurora rack has 64 of these blades. We also call them nodes. And each node has six GPUs. That's these things here. And two CPUs with memory, RAM, which is these things here. And then we have networking. This rack is very, very heavy. And one really cool thing about this, the fact that, as you can see, there is a blue and a white. That's where water comes in. So the entire system is water-cooled. The water will flow through these white tubes, cooling the GPUs and the CPUs, because it gets hot. How about we go and check out the mechanical room? Sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Come follow us. This is the South Mechanical Room. We're next to Aurora. Check out these pipes. There are 44,000 gallons of water flowing through the pipes and cooling down Aurora. And that's why Aurora is a water-cooled system, which is much more efficient than a fan-cooled system. Not only is the temperature important, the chemistry is important as well. If the pH isn't just right in the water, bacteria can grow, clogging up the pipes. I kind of feel like playing Mario in this room. <laughs> well, a lot of plumbers work on these systems, and they're really important to them running efficiently. That's about cool. I can work on Aurora from anywhere. I can log in right on my laptop, even outside. The things that I do at the facility is I support workflow tools. So I help our scientists run very complex calculations, many of individual tasks that are linked together on our computers. Welcome to this lab. This is where I work. So what we do with the visualization team is that we work with domain scientists, the people who actually use Aurora and run simulations and we help them visualize their data so that they can get insights. You can think of us kind of like the Pixar of the scientific data sets. We're looking at, into a lot of things, for instance, human health. Material sciences. Climate change. Clean energy technology. Astrophysics. And cosmology. This is some of the science we do here in the Viz Lab with Aurora. So all the components we've seen together, they have to work together so we can have the two exaflops that Aurora has to offer. That's roughly the processing power of one million computers. And that's five times faster than our current fastest machine and a million times faster than machines of 20 years ago. That's the power of Aurora. <sighs> this is what happens when you invite somebody to your home. They never leave. You guys gotta go now. We've got work to do. Gotta go. Go, 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 go. My name is Joanne Kelly Cogdell. I'm the CEO of Naxos Neighbors, and we create harm reduction technology to engage, support, and grow compassionate communities. And right now, South Bend is desperately in need of being one of these com compassionate communities. We have an overdose death rate in the city that is more than double the national average. And what that means is that we're losing a life in the city every three to four days to an overdose death. Naxos Neighbors and Dr. Mario Lieberman, professor of analytical chemistry at the University of Notre Dame, got together to decide how can we solve this problem? How can we create a safe space where people can get their drugs checked and share the information with us so that we can save lives? Our goal is to get data about uh, the composition of street drugs in South Bend. Real-time data collection is uh, incredibly important because the drug supply changes so quickly. The problem is that we continue to leave out the most important people who have the most accurate and timely data, and that's people who use drugs. Until we include them in the process, we are not gonna solve this problem. Dr. Mara Lieberman and her lab have created a novel way to collect drug information from used 
test strips. What this means is that a person can safely test their drugs in a private environment and then get basic information about what is in the drug supply. They can then send those used test strips, which are normally thrown in the trash, to Dr. Lieberman's lab, where she will analyze them for over 70 possible drug contaminants. After a person has tested their drug, they might decide to use that drug in a different way, a safer way, or even to not take it if it has a component that they weren't expecting or that they don't want. And for a lot of people, that information could be literally life-saving. The results of that process will then be placed in Naxos Neighbors, Naxos OD app. Those results will be anonymous and they'll be available to anyone in the community who is interested in this project and wants more information about what's happening with the drug supply. To date, we have validated those test strips. We have created drug testing kits and our process for collection with our community partners. We think that this could be a scalable approach that would be useful in many other communities across the United States. Overdose deaths are 100% preventable. And what we aim to do is to have a comprehensive community process that takes us from data collection to dissemination of alerts, to agency dispatch, so that we can actually act on the data that we're getting from people who use drugs to save lives and to prevent overdose deaths. Across the U.S., particularly in major cities, there's been sort of a resurgence of urban farming and people really taking the time to really know where their food is coming from. My research really involves working with communities to find solutions to getting healthy foods in neighborhoods where there may not be. A lot of the work that we do is in Camden, and many of the, the neighborhoods that we're working in don't have access to a full-service grocery store. My research really focuses around really finding those champions and leaders that are in the community that want to make change, and we work together to create sort of solutions. And there's no greater pleasure than, than growing your own food and picking it and eating it. You talk about a rush. Oh my, what? Especially hot peppers. There you go. I've learned a tremendous amount from the farmers, and I think that that is really the hallmark of the type of work I do, which is community-based participatory research. The students that work in my research lab are really filling a, a great need. So we're working on invoicing, we're working on packaging, we're working on picking up the produce. I want to be able to provide food for people that really need it, especially in communities like Camden, where you know it's historically poor in black communities. So we've been fortunate enough to work with um, Virtual Health System and they actually um, are buying the produce that then is available on their mobile farmers market as well as their mobile um, grocery store. So far the preliminary data is showing that people are increasing their fruit and vegetable intake. And we still have a ways to go but we're excited about this direction because it's sort of a win-win, right? You're really providing economic opportunity as well as improving health. And if we really want communities to thrive that haven't, we really need to start putting investments back in the community. Health is really our wealth. My name is Adam Wakeman. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at SUNY Upstate Medical University. Our lab was recently awarded a grant from the SUNY Research Foundation to accelerate the development of a novel monoclonal antibody therapy to treat or prevent dengue virus infections. Dengue is a disease that's caused by infection with one of four dengue virus serotypes. Unlike any other virus or most other viruses, an infection with one dengue serotype doesn't provide you from protection against infection with another dengue serotype. It can actually put you at risk of a more severe infection. So our goal is to try to develop a therapy that counteracts that risk and can provide you protection from both a first and a second dengue infection. 
There are approximately 400 million people that are infected with dengue virus every year, and there are about 3 billion people that are at risk of infection. So dengue virus is arguably one of the most widespread pathogens in the world. We currently don't have any therapies to treat or prevent dengue virus infections. We can provide you supportive care, hopefully prevent you from developing some of the really severe manifestations of the disease by providing you liquid and other painkillers, but we don't have anything that will actually reduce the duration of the infection itself. There are vaccines that are available and that are being developed, but they are most effective in people that have already had dengue virus infections. So there's really a gap in the field, gap in the treatment that we're hoping to fill with an antibody therapy that is both safe and effective against all strains of dengue virus. The funding that we're receiving from the SUNY Research Foundation in the form of this Technology Accelerator Fund Award is in allowing us to do some of the early pivotal, pivotal work that is going to lay the groundwork for moving these antibodies that we're trying to develop into advanced stage trials. Anyone who would want more information about what we're doing and what we hope to do or would be interested in collaborating can find out more information on our lab website or through the SUNY Research Foundation. The wildfires erupting across the islands of Maui and Hawaii. It's driven wildfires on the Greek island. Firefighters are now... Straight. In Northern California, the most destructive and deadliest fire in state history has turned the town of... Fire is a complex problem. And to solve such a complex problem, you need cross-disciplinary, cross-sector partnerships. I think at UC San Diego, we have the perfect culture for this type of convergent thinking. Why Fire Lab works with emergency management and fire science community to develop technologies to combat the mega fires. How Why Fire Lab started was a National Science Foundation project to bring real-time data together with fire models. Really fast, uh, that turned into a platform that all fire chiefs in California today use a cold fire map. What fire map does is bring together monitoring tools for real-time data. Fast fire behavior models means fast decisions can be made. So Alert California is a multi-hazard public safety platform developed here at the University of California, San Diego. Its whole mission is to prepare, respond, recover from events. So we collect data that tells us the health of the forest. We can look at which fuels are drier, have lower moisture content. Having data before an event allows us to manage and plan. Alert California has deployed a statewide sensor network with over a thousand sensors online right now. These sensors deliver up to two billion data points per second continuously. So Alert California provides a data portal that anyone, anywhere, at any time can use to see the data feeds that are coming in from every single sensor in the network. Since 2017, California has seen $40 billion of property losses in wildfires. And that's not to say anything about all the money that has been spent trying to manage and put out those fires. My work on wildfires is really focused on trying to leverage the improved scientific understanding that others are developing to try and better manage and respond to wildfire risk. We've seen in the past several years that it's become harder and harder to buy homeowners insurance. That's an enormous problem because that home is a huge part of the overall financial portfolio of that family. So one of the most important things I think that we can do as economists is try and understand how to make those markets function better and make sure that insurance is available and appropriately priced throughout the United States. It doesn't just affect the landscape it hits, it actually affects the communities around it. Even uh, mental health is a part of the issue here. Campfire occurred in 2018 
We wanted to look at mental health impacts, um, especially related to post-traumatic stress and anxiety and depression symptoms that emerge. What we found was that PTSD is three times greater than the general population. And similarly, anxiety and depression can be 1.5 to two times more prevalent than the general population. We're partnering with many community stakeholders and leaders to figure out which interventions can be sustainable and also protect the mental health of the people. These events are not going away. And if we can do better management and moves the needle just a little bit, all of us working together, competing against extreme climate, not each other, is the way forward. A lot of childhood memories involve my brother in the hospital. In any given year, he would go to the hospital about six times, each time for about two weeks, but not all of those memories are bad. He has just a way of making um, even hospital stays sort of fun. I remember bringing Nerf guns to the hospital, and pretty soon all the nurses had Nerf guns as well. There were darts littering the floor and all over my room, and I remember I was, I was a crack shot. Hi, I'm Ellie, and I have cystic fibrosis. Hi, I'm Rihanna Lee, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Cell Biology and Physiology. Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease that affects the lungs and digestive system primarily. In the lungs, it causes a buildup of a thick, sticky mucus, which creates a lot of cough um, and trouble with cough clearance. That sort of environment um, just becomes a breeding ground for bacterial infection, which leads to chronic inflammation. To have CF, you have to have two mutations. Um, my brother has one copy of f 508 del which is the most common CFTR mutation. And then his second copy is S492F, which is an extremely rare um, CFTR variant. There's a lot of medicine, of course, and it takes so much medicine. With uh, like practical day-to-day, -day, it's a lot of getting really tired real easy. Uh, I can just do a, a little bit of exercise and my, my heart rate's going like crazy and I'm breathing real hard. Big coughing fits are definitely not uncommon. At UNC, I focus on developing small molecule CFTR therapies for people with rare types of CF. So right now, about 90% of people with CF are eligible for small molecule therapy, but the remaining 10% have sort of a different type of CF that's much more challenging to treat. We in our lab do some work to both develop cell lines for studying that rare 10%, and then we also look into new small molecule therapies using the cell lines that we've developed. In 2018, we collected a nasal cell sample from my little brother, and we created a cell line from his cells since he does have that one rare mutation. At the time, there were no treatments that he was currently eligible for, but in 2019, Trikafta was approved, which is a sort of breakthrough therapy, it makes a huge difference for those who are eligible for it. And so we tested Trikafta on my brother's cells, both in the cell line and on his primary cells directly from his nose. Both the cell line and the primary cells predicted that he would be a robust responder to therapy. Then when he was actually able to start taking the um, Trikafta itself, um, he did actually respond really well. And it's just made a big difference in his health and quality of life. Before Trikafta, um, life expectancy for people with CF was about 39 years old. And then just with the approval of this one drug, um, life expectancy is now 49. This new treatment added roughly 10 years to my brother's life. Trikafta, I, I always say it really is like a miracle drug. Within the first week, I my lung function just shot up. I remember during that time, between the coughing out everything that was in my lungs, feeling like this weird, like, it was like an energy in my chest. And I'm like, is this breathing? <laughs> it was such a surreal feeling. Give it a month or so and I felt greater than I've ever been. My sister is, has always been super smart, very practical and dedicated. She's always been very determined to go down this path of researching stuff. 
it's real, like, sort of like an honor kind of feeling to know that she got into this very complex field and researching because I was sick. So it's, it's kind of awesome knowing that, you know, she would go that distance and that me being sick as sort of a purpose like that. Like, a lot of medicine research is getting done and partially because I'm, I'm sick. My research interest tends to fall pretty closely to death penalty. My primary focus right now is this project I'm calling Bearing Witness. I came to know a man on Delaware's death row because I was working with Delaware death row inmates. And when he was served a death warrant, um, his mother wanted to witness. He didn't want her to because he was worried it would haunt her. So she asked if I would do it in her place, and he asked if I would. So I didn't hesitate because I wanted to be able to give that mother a sense of peace that there would be a face, of, a kind, loving face of somebody who cared for her son to be there. I remember looking around the witnessing room and the death chamber at all the different people who were involved as witnesses and thinking, this is really messed up. I'm traumatized. Is it just me? I decided to take off in an RV with my dog and travel the nation to look at the impact that witnessing an execution has upon people, regardless of the role they're playing, regardless of the reason they're there, and there are many different players in the room. I wanted to let them know, look, I want to come and interview you, but not as an activist who's going to debate the death penalty with you or try and talk you out of your position. As a trained sociologist, we always want to understand how all these demographic variables, all these life experiences, and the social structure, institutionalized structures, impact how people are affected by particular events. Most people would say that they were significantly impacted by the execution. People can say in non-death penalty states, well, it's not impacting me because I don't live in a state where there's executions. I'm like, well, but let me correct you. There's a federal death penalty, but we need to hear from the people who are actually witnessing it. They're the eyes and ears for the rest of society, and they're very crucial in the ongoing dialogue we're having about whether we should continue the death penalty. My future plans for this research include a film and a book, and in both it will show the evidence from the interviews with witnesses from different roles in different parts of the country. So this can help be part of that conversation. We are in Conza Prairie. The Conza Prairie is a long-term ecological research center for all types of research. We are here to sample a whole bunch of things, water chemistry, macro invertebrates or bugs, and where the water is moving between the ground and the surface to understand how these streams go dry and what the implications are for the quality of the water. Intermittent streams are those that do not flow continuously. About half of the stream miles worldwide are intermittent. So these are very common but understudied types of ecosystems. This is the aquatic intermittency effects of microbiomes in streams, Ames project. The group is a collaborative effort among eight different institutions. KU is the lead institution. It's nice to be around people that just like enjoy hiking up a stream and also enjoy the research process. It reaffirms my love for nature and being outside and it reaffirms like when somebody asks me what I do, I don't go, oh, I study the environment. I'm like, no, I study streams and I'm thinking about the water chemistry and the microbes and the little guys you can't even see. It brings out the little kid in me. <laughs> All of this is within the Kansas River watershed. So all these intermittent streams are, are embedded in this larger 
watershed that approximately a third of Kansans drink out of. It's a lot. We are covering a lot of ground. The Institute for Future Mobility is bringing together our great resources on campus in the area of mobility that make people's lives better. Our research is leading in the areas of materials, making electric vehicles lighter and more efficient, making batteries smaller and more dense, making our challenge supply chains more efficient. We have great research in decarbonization and electrification that will bring innovation to electric vehicles, automated vehicles, and will move our world further. We're also looking at alternative fuels. We're looking at the infrastructure, the economics, and the modes of transportation that we can use to move people and goods. UT has always valued strong partnerships with industry, both for our students and for our research. We have a long-standing relationship with Volkswagen that has propelled both Volkswagen and our research and development programs. Our National Science Foundation funded statewide mobility initiative called Team Tennessee expands us even further. We have over 100 partners with industry, community, and our education partners throughout the state. What we want to do is provide the opportunity for UT expertise to help train the next generation of automotive professionals, whether they work in the factory or they work in research and development. Our work will bring more automotive companies to the state of Tennessee, which will provide opportunities for students to stay in the state of Tennessee once they graduate. Whenever we've gone out there, the waves are crashing and you can hear them but you can't see them and there are crabs running around everywhere. So it's a bit of a process taking these measurements in the pitch black. The Outer Banks are really developed in a lot of places and continuing to develop and that comes with a lot of artificial light at night. We don't really fully understand the impacts of it. There's a lot of research being done that's showing that it really can mess up the behavior of animals because you don't have those natural cues of the daytime and the nighttime anymore because there's always light. The Capstone Project this year is focusing on artificial light at night and what some of the social perceptions are and how artificial light has changed with regard to extent and how intense it is. We have what's called a sky quality meter, which is what we use to measure the light at night. And we pretty much just like stick it up in the air when we're facing the ocean and take a measurement with it. It gives us a number, we record it. We do that four separate times facing different directions. We also are kind of observing what's happening around the area that we're taking measurements. So if there's any really noticeable light sources, if there are any cars in the area, and we are also looking at constellations, what stars we can see, and then also cloud coverage because clouds reflect light. So that can also impact our measurements. The capstone topic is something that um, Lindsay and I sort of land on before the semester starts, but it's original research, so we don't know the answers, and we don't know necessarily how it's going to go. It's not like a traditional class in that sense. And so the students have a lot of agency over what we do for second and third, and how much of the different methodologies they choose to do, or where they might do their data collection. So while we've chosen the topic and we have a sense of what the methods might be, the students have to make a lot of decisions about a lot of the details, and research is <laughs> all about details. So they do have a lot of say over what happens and how it happens. A skill that I've like gained from being part of this research project would be 
learning how to take your ideas from being a concept and actually practicing them and making them into something that could be tangible. I've never created a survey like this before, so having those kind of skills, going out and actually doing research and then analyzing the measurements that we're getting and comparing it to other data has been a really useful experience for me. I hope that students leave the program with not just skills related to the particular methods, but I really hope that they leave with skills around critical thinking, like how to approach a problem and think through a process. I see the Outer Banks as a place where students can learn to be stewards of their environment and also the community around them. The tools that we teach and the way that we teach students to be observant helps them to become stewards elsewhere when they leave this place. I've always been interested in conservation and natural resource management. Being here just further cements that's the field that I want to pursue and I feel like I've gained more confidence in what I want to do by being part of this. The Yellowstone landscape remains one of my absolute favorite places on the planet. I feel like I've grown up with these trees. I will say as a scientist, it has just been an absolute privilege to be able to study this system. But Yellowstone will change and it's changing at a faster rate than perhaps we had anticipated. I started in Yellowstone as a ranger naturalist at Old Faithful when I was 19 years old. And that summer is why I chose to become an ecologist. I've been studying the forests in Yellowstone for 35 years. We started during and then right after the 1988 wildfires. So Yellowstone and the 88 fires have given us a benchmark for, for kind of what happens in the historical, the normal sorts of conditions. Fire is very much a natural part of the forest in Yellowstone. We know that fires have burned in this landscape for the past 10,000 years at intervals of about 100 to 300 years. So historically, the forest regrows and it's mature before it burns again. Following the fires, you see just a carpet of tree seedlings coming right back in in the first year. It takes these forests almost 100 years to recover from a previous fire. As the climate is now getting warmer and we're seeing drier conditions every summer, the fire return interval is starting to change. If the fires return before the trees have had a chance to produce cones and have seeds, these immature trees just don't have any seed source. Even if the seeds are available, with a warming climate, the soils may be too hot and too dry for the seedlings to germinate and establish and grow successfully into big trees. Many of those vast forests that we see throughout the landscape may disappear and be re replaced by non-forest vegetation. The forests are really struggling now to establish and survive. The climate seems to us to be changing at a faster rate than the tree species are even able to adapt and keep up. But what does that mean for the future of this landscape? How is this iconic area going to change as the 21st century unfolds? So obviously we can't collect data from a landscape that doesn't exist yet, but we also can't wait 40 or 50 more years to see what will happen. Instead, we use computer models which build on our years of past data to explore how the future may unfold, specifically to understand how the carbon emissions that are changing the atmosphere will affect the climate and the fire and the future of the Yellowstone landscape.
That gives us an idea of how and where the landscape will change. Some areas may transition actually away from forests and into sagebrush or grassland or meadow. That would mean less trees to provide shade on the trails and along the rivers for hiking and fishing. It would mean that the animal species who rely on older forests will have less habitat. The overall aesthetic of the park is also going to change as the majestic old growth forests disappear. Yellowstone is so well known, it's the world's first national park. It's a good place to both help people appreciate the magnitude of climate change and the potential changes that we'll see in a landscape, and to do so in a place that people, they, they love. One of my doctoral students, Timon Keller, is using photographs that we can change based on the results of our computer simulation models that have been well tested and validated for this region and translating those into pictures of landscapes that people see as they visit the Tetons and Yellowstone and the surrounding lands. We've thought a lot about how we can communicate this work effectively and make sure that the results of the models that we produce are intuitive um, and easy for people to understand as they're passing by. And that's where those pictures come in. It is really hard for people to visualize a landscape that they haven't seen yet and to get people to understand the urgency of how things may change. So we hope that by depicting that, we'll help them understand really what changes are likely to happen in the future. This is just such a cool reminder that the science that we do um, matters for people. We want to engage people in that process and share what we find to make people's lives better. And I think that really is something very special about this opportunity. I know that places like Yellowstone are going to still be beautiful. There's still going to be places that inspire us. We know so many changes are coming. They're not going to be the same as they were. But I have hope in the next generation of scientists and in our younger citizens. So many of them have been inspired by the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and they really want to work hard to protect it. We can implement policies to restore the atmosphere, slow the rate of change, and protect Yellowstone and so many other natural areas and the resources on which all of us depend. Yellowstone is going to look different in the future, but how different it will become depends on all of us.